It's time to accelerate. Hi, I'm your host, Andy Paul. Join me as I host conversations with the leading experts in sales, marketing, sales automation, sales process, leadership, management, training, coaching, any resource that I believe to help you accelerate the growth of your sales, your business, and most importantly, you. Hello and welcome to Accelerate. I am really excited to talk with my guest today. Joining me is John Spence. You know, John's a strategist, consultant, speaker, author of several books, including Awesomely Simple, which is essential business strategies for turning ideas into action, and more recently, Letters to a CEO. John has made a career of making the very complex awesomely simple. He is recognized as a top 100 business thought leader in America. And has a list of other recognitions and awards that I could recite, but they would only make me feel wholly inadequate talking to them. So (laughs) listeners to the show know that the topics of continuous learning and personal and professional development are extremely important to me. And I keep bringing guests on the show to talk about this topic, not because I want to keep nagging you about this, but because the habit of continuous learning may be the single most important contributor to your success in sales and business and in life. And my guest today, John Spence, writes and talks about this extensively. He's going to share his insights and hopefully open some eyes, minds, and hearts today to the subject. So, John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Andy. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So, take a minute, introduce yourself, fill out the introduction a little bit. Well, uh, I'll give you the quick thumbnail. Uh, After failing out of college on the first try, Yahoo, Mm -hmm. uh, I graduated in the top three of the United States in my major uh, from the University of Florida got hired to work for one of the Rockefeller Foundations and at the age of 26 was named CEO of that foundation. And it, it, we're going to speak to that directly around our topic today. Um, stayed and did that for about six years, traveled all over the world with them. And then I left to take over as CEO of a strategic sales training firm that uh, did mostly uh, deals of $100 million or larger mm-hmm. for major Fortune 100 companies. Again, did that for a few years. Then I decided to go independent, and for the last 21 years, I've traveled about 200 days a year worldwide, uh, focusing on helping businesses and people be more successful. Wow. So, tell us about the Rockefeller Foundation, 26. Yeah, 26, and and, and it goes right to what we said. Well, actually, let's go back to to failing out of college. I failed out of the University of Miami. Uh, That's bad enough, but my father was- That had to be pretty hard to do. Oh, oh! It takes effort. It takes yeah. I had a 1.6 GPA. Uh, uh, problem is, all my friends had a 1.0, a 1.3, a 0.9. I was the academic stud of my group at a 1.6. Uh, but the what makes it much worse is my father was one of the top alumni ever to graduate from the University of Miami. The year I got kicked out, he was on the board of directors, mm. and there was a wing of the law school named after my father. So you really have to try hard to get kicked out of a college where there's a building named after your family. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then I, um, I came up to Gainesville, Florida, where I live now, applied at the University of Florida, where they literally laughed at me, uh, went to a, a community college here, and that's where I met a professor that changed my life. And it goes right to our point. His name was Roger Strickland, and he, I was, he heard me explained to some of the other kids in the class that I really, really had to do well because I had to get into the University of Florida and turn my life around. And he pulled me aside. He said, John, there's only three things it takes to be successful in college. Just three things. Number one, read the books. He said, at least in college, 90% of the answers are in the books. Uh, Number two, ask for help. You're not supposed to do this alone. There's a lot of people here to help you. And if you ask them, you're going to get a ton of help. And by default, if you get a ton of help, you're going to do better. And number three, and this we'll speak about this later today, is go start study groups. So I would stand up at the beginning of every class, every semester, and go, hi, I'm John. I really want to do well in this class. Uh, I'm going to have a study group at my house Tuesday and Thursday night, 7 to 10 p.m. We'll study for three hours, go out and get a beer afterwards. And anyone is welcome to be in my study group as long as you have a 3.6 GPA or higher. <laughs> Nobody ever asked me what my GPA was because I set up the groups. But if you fast forward, and, and that's when I took up the habit of reading because I realized that every book I read got me closer to an A. When I graduated, I started the habit of reading, and you're going to love this, a minimum of 100 books a year to try to get myself ahead. I read 100 to 120 business books a year. When I was in my maybe my third year at the Rockefeller Foundation, I was sitting at a, I would often sit in on the board meetings with, we had three billionaires on my board, and everyone else was worth more than 100 million. And they would bring up a, a thorny problem and say, you know, and look right at my CEO and say, what do you think we should do about this? 
and he'd be like, uh, 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 and I'd sort of raise my hand and say, well, I was reading this book the other day called In Search of Excellence, and it was talking about loose, tight controls and chunking and management by walking mm-hmm. around. And I was read this other book that said this, that, and the other. And then there's this other book I read that said this, and I'll never forget it. One of the billionaires would go, brilliant ideas. Let's go with Spence's ideas. And I'm thinking, the, those weren't my ideas. That's stuff I read in a book. But as far as they were concerned, I was the one that was coming up with all the great ideas. So a, a couple of years later, the CEO um, struggled with the board, a lot of pressure, and he left the organization. And they put me in temporarily at 26 to, to run the place until they found an, a new CEO. And I ended up staying in that position for several years because the organi- organization did so well. And I can attain, put it directly on two key ideas. A, incredible staff of, of extremely bright people I was very honored to work with. And number two is I was, I was a fanatic for reading, studying, learning anything I could about how to make the business better, how to make myself better. And that's the only thing that got me through that trial because I was obviously far too young to have the experience to be successful, but I picked up a lot of the ideas and information from other people's experience. Right. So let's start with sort of a, a tough question about this. Is I, There's no sim- single answer probably, but why is this so hard, right? When I, yeah, I work primarily with salespeople and CEOs, entrepreneurs, small and mid-sized enterprises, and, you know, the CEOs tend to be curious and then the curiosity level tends to fall off the further down the organization you go. Where people you think that would were in the same situation you were and I was at the beginning of my career where... I couldn't read enough to learn. You know, I interviewed Tom Hopkins earlier this year telling about, you know, it's one of the first books I read. I just devoured that, you know, that and Zig Ziglar and so on. I just couldn't read enough about sales early on in the career. What's holding people back from making this investment? A couple of things, a couple of things. I thought about this deeply. Um, the first one I'll tell you is, is something I learned from one of my mentors who is one of the top psychologists in America. She was sort of the four of our time, um, had written dozens and dozens of books, been a psychiatrist, psychologist rather, for about 55 years. And I asked her, what's the single biggest problem you see in people? I mean, you've spent a half a century helping people improve, going through, what's the biggest problem? She didn't even hesitate. She looked right at me and said, John, people do what seems easy and convenient in their lives, not what is best for them. So one of it is just basically going with the flow. Uh, number two is you got to be passionate. If you don't love business, if you're not excited about approaching sales as a craft, as a true professional, um, you won't see a lot of value in improving your skills. But if you really see it as your calling, as something that's noble, as something you love, you're excited about, helping people passionate, you should want to learn more and more and more every day. Now, the, the third thing I'll say is the bar is very low. Uh, if you were to read one business book every other month, six business books a year, you'd be in the top 1% in the United States of America for self-learning. If you were to read one a month, 12 books a year, you're in the top 1% in the world. Um, You were kind enough to mention at the beginning of the interview, I was named one of the top 100 business thought leaders in America. I just made a list of top uh, 50 leaders to watch in America, along with Sergey Brin, Larry Page, Jeff Bezos, a whole bunch of other people. I'm not a genius. I'm just the only guy you know that reads 100, 120 business books a year, listens to another 30 or 40, and has written a bunch. I'm not that smart, but what I do is I have access to a lot of information. And the last thing that I'll say is, and I learned this when I was working for the Rockefellers, is the first year I got there, uh, I was reading like a banshee, learning, growing, coming up with ideas. Everybody got a $500 bonus, and I got a $1,000 bonus. The next year, everyone got a $1,000 bonus, and I got a $3,000 bonus. The next year, everyone got a $3,000 bonus, and I became CEO. <laughs> so, <laughs> Your bonus is much said, higher, yeah. Yeah, well, I looked at it and said, for every book I, I read, I can literally see a jump in my income. And, and I've known that my whole life, so I've kept on that 100, 120 book pace. Now, I will say I don't read the entire book. Um, you know, because I've read so much, I will get to stories I've seen a hundred times and I can right. skip those. Right. Um, if I get 50 pages into a book and I haven't underlined anything, I put it down. I won't waste my time. Uh, and then I've got a system for, you know, I don't read just to read. I'm reading to look for information that will help me. And that's, I think that's another reason that people don't read as much is I'm constantly looking for stuff that's going to make me better, sharper, smarter, faster, more competitive, more professional. And when you start to get addicted to learning that, you realize, A, it's fun, and B, boy, does it help your career. 
Yeah, and I I love hearing you talk about how you read books because that's how I do it as well. Because I have the same thing. I I'm not at 120, but I probably am at 50 books a year. And you know, part of this is my job, right? As as how to as a sales thought leader, even before I started this podcast, how could I presume to be in a position to offer people advice and guidance and coaching if I didn't feel like I was serving what's available out there to help improve myself to give them more value? Um, I was going to say that we mentioned before we went on the air that I, I, I'm in a mastermind group with Anthony and Urino, uh, Jeb Blunt, Mark Hunter, Mike Weinberg, and Miles Austin. And we just did a presentation up in DC, and I was asked to talk about how do you become the best in the world at what you do. And it would be really, really hard for me to stand up and give that presentation if I wasn't, <laughs> if I wasn't in the top 50 or 100. So when you say it, if, if you're going to be a sales coach or a sales leader and you, you're going to set the example for the rest of your sales team, it's really hard to do that if you're not the one setting the pace in lifelong learning in self-improvement in self-education. So an interesting question that comes up, and I hear this more and more and it's, it's partially associated with people thinking this is associated with the, the new generation millennials and so on coming into the workforce is, well, yeah, great, but why, why isn't the company helping me with this? Why, why am I expected to do this on my own? Well, you should expect the company to do about 15% of it for you. If the company doesn't do 10, 15, 20% for you, you shouldn't be working there because they don't value their employees. But that's the bare minimum. That's the absolute, that's what everybody else gets. And so if you want to be like everybody else, then just take what the company teaches you and you can, and you'll ride that wave of mediocrity for the rest of your career. How exciting. Uh, but if you truly want to get ahead and move ahead, you have to invest in yourself. But here's the really cool thing is, we, you know, once you invest in yourself, no one can ever take that away from you. It's not like if you leave the company, they go, could we have all the knowledge we gave you back, please? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and you're just investing in your own career. So let's say you, you decide you don't like that company. Now you've got the, a big wealth of knowledge. You've got information, ideas, creativity that other people don't have. And if you stay in that company, that's your road to success. So it isn't about what does the company owe me? It's what do I owe myself and what do I have to do in order to get where I want to be in my career? Yeah, and there's a, I don't know if you've heard of a gentleman, Tim Wackel, who's a speaker and business coach and so on. That He's got this 30-20-10 formula, which is every day, exercise or meditate. Do something for you physically, your physical and mental well-being, 30 minutes. Read for 20 minutes and write for 10. Reflect about what you read and what you thought about. And there's an hour a day. And if you do that, yeah, you'll read. You'll be in that top 1%. You'll read at least 12 business books a year. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the ways I do it is I don't watch TV. Uh, you know, the average American watches 27 to 37 hours of TV a week, a week. equivalent to their job. Right. Equivalent to their job. Uh, I watch maybe 37 hours of TV a year. Uh, I, when I travel, I unplug the TV in the uh, hotel room as soon as I get there. So if I'm on the road 200 days a year, there's 200 days a year I don't watch TV at all. I do read. I get up every morning and I read Flipboard for about 45 minutes to an hour while I'm at breakfast. So I mm -hmm. catch up on all the news. I see what's going on. I know current events probably as well or better than anybody. So I'm not you know, lost, but I don't really value TV that much. And if there's something really special coming on or there's you know something unique on PBS, I might watch that or a cooking show. But just general sitcoms and things like that, um, to me, I'd rather invest that time in reading, studying, learning, painting, being with my friends, going to the gym, doing something healthy rather than doing some now a lot of people like tv and they enjoy it and it, it's a way for them to relax that's fine but rarely do you find somebody at the top of their game that spends 20 or 30 hours a week watching tv yeah and i teach this and i blog about this i just you know just give up one episode per week of the bachelor or the bachelorette or some some show that that you're never going to miss in your life you know start there i mean if you're not ready to go cold turkey Start with an hour, because if you do an hour a week, that will give you the opportunity to at least read a book a month. Or what do what I do is I, I still like to watch video stuff, so I watch TED Talks. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm if I get to the evening and I, I I have a rule in my house that I will not read any business stuff in my home. I only read philosophy or history or uh, religious things or you know, spiritual things or stuff like that or stuff that's fun. Uh, but if I get in the evening and I don't feel like reading, I just open up my iPad and I watch a couple, I, uh, couple of TED Talks. 
or I Google something really cool on YouTube and watch something fun, exciting, and interesting on YouTube, uh, or Netflix, a documentary, but something that I say, hey, I'm gonna I'm gonna spend this time learning and having fun and enjoying myself. Every now and then I'll watch uh, you know, a shoot 'em up, bang 'em up adventure movie. <laughs> but for the most part, I'm gonna watch a TED talk that could be life changing and it's only 18 minutes. And, right. and you know, so if you watch one TED talk a night or you know, twice a week you watch a TED talk, I'm gonna guarantee you get to the end of the year, you're gonna be a uh, you're gonna have some new knowledge, some new information, something that's gonna make you a better person, a better salesperson, a better mother, father, husband, brother, sister, from the neat stuff you you learn from these incredibly brilliant people. Yeah, and I think if you manage to improve yourself in one dimension, it bleeds over into all the others. Yeah, you know, one dimension of your life. It's business, it's gonna bleed over into your personal life, it's personal, it's gonna bleed into your business. Well, I, I just, I had to write, I write for a couple of magazines and I just had to write an article this week on work-life balance. And, I, you know, I, I had a senior executive at a major company once ask me, how do, you, how do you stage, it was a female, she said, how do you become a C-level executive at a multi-billion dollar, you know, multinational company and still have time to watch your kids play soccer, be involved in a, in a hobby, stay fit, be involved in my faith, put a healthy dinner on the table and have a relationship with my husband? And I looked at her and said, you don't. And if anyone told you you could, they lied to you. That, you know, to, to be at that level is an all-consuming profession. Uh, and she's like, wow, finally somebody told me. I go, there's no such thing as work-life balance at no. that level. And, and I don't know if anybody else has used this phrase, but I, it's what I came up with in the magazine article. What I look for is life, work, purpose. My life is my work. My work is my life. But I want it to be around a purpose that is important to me so that every time I'm in the office working, I'm improving myself as an individual. And when I'm home with my family and doing things that are important to me with my friends and my family, that that's making me a better person when I come back into my quote unquote work life. Yeah, no, it makes great sense. All right. When we come back, we're going to take a short break. When we come back, I want to talk about uh, an article you'd written recently about the knowledge account balance, which I thought was really fun and that we should expose people to. So we'll be right back with my guest, John Spence. Hi, this is Andy. Connect and Sell is used by sales reps at nearly a thousand companies, including hundreds of technology startups and several Fortune 500 companies, to overcome the challenges of getting prospects on the phone. Companies using Connect and Sell grow their revenues faster by enabling their sales reps to have more sales conversations in 90 minutes than they could otherwise achieve in an entire week. Connect and Sell can be deployed directly to your sales reps, or you can take advantage of their outbound on-demand service, which delivers qualified prospect meetings scheduled directly on your sales reps' calendars. Visit connectandsell.com to learn more about how Connect and Sell can start filling your pipeline today. All right, we're back with my guest today, John Spence. You've written about what you call the knowledge account balance, which I thought was great. And I love the I love the quote that you let off with from Thomas Huxley, which is a f- favorite quote of mine, which is know something about everything and everything about something, which I thought was a fantastic, uh, fantastic way to approach knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we mentioned it in part one of this is when I read a book or what I'm studying, I'm looking for specific information, something that's going to help me increase my knowledge in an area where I have expertise. So I don't read about financial management and I don't read about lean manufacturing and I don't read about, you know, Six Sigma process stuff. My expertise is in leadership, high performance teams, culture, and consultative sales, those sort of areas. So everything I pick up is going to try to get me ahead in that area. By default, I'm going to learn some other stuff. And I and like I said, I read some history and some biographies and some other stuff, some military stuff that's fun. Mm-hmm. But 80% of my reading is focused in two or three areas. And when I pick up the book, I'm looking for information that will help me, not just to read fun stories or hear neat case studies. That's nice. I'm looking for stuff that I can write down and say, I can take that now and put that in my repertoire. And that's a piece of, piece of knowledge that has real value to me and to my clients. All right. Well, you had three elements in your knowledge account balance, right? So the first one was committing to lifelong learning, which we've, we've talked about. But it's really, it's a mix of items too. I mean, it's not just, at least to me, it's not just reading. It could entail writing as well. Writing, audiobooks, video books. Another one, which is great, and I've got them coming over, probably they'll be in my office here in about an hour, is I've got a mastermind group. And once about every 45 days, I have 18 of the top CEOs in my community where I live 
uh, come over to my house and we have some cocktails and a chili and relax or some dinner. And then we go on the back deck of my house and for three hours, we talk about business. We talk about life. We help each other, uh, each other out. For the next one we have that's coming up next Tuesday, uh, I've got a few visiting me this afternoon, but next Tuesday, uh, we're doing the Internet of Things. And we've all mm-hmm. researched it. We've read about it. We've studied it. A couple of the folks sent out articles for all us to read. And we will have a, a really good, solid conversation for three or four hours about how will the Internet of Things impact our business, our community, other businesses, our lives. And that's a great way to learn, and it's also a great way to learn while building strong relationships and having fun with your friends. Yeah, and the point I was making earlier about writing was that, you know, one of the ways that it's great to absorb knowledge, but one of the ways you really crystallize what it is you think you've learned is to sit down and write it down. Yeah, I'm a big fan for journaling. Mm-hmm. I've been journaling since uh, college. I write stuff down. I carry a book with me everywhere I go. And when I see something that's interesting or I learn something that's interesting, I write it down. And, and actually, right before this call, I have three of my journals sitting in front of me. I'm getting ready to do something for one of my clients. And I said, let me go back and look through some of the stuff I wrote on this to refresh my own memory. And then one of the things I do is the minute I finish a book, I will write down all the key stuff I learned from it. And after I've highlighted, then what I do is When I come back to my office, I will read the highlighting into my computer and my notes out of my journal, and then I'll condense that down to a one- or two-page overview. Then I reread that overview two or three times, and if it's really, really good, I will read it into into an audio file, and then I listen to the audio file in my car. Hmm. Very cool. I hadn't thought about all that. Well, it's the way I I have a semi-photographic memory, but if I read it, if I read it twice, I write it down. I speak it, I read it again, and then I listen to it. I've got I've got that knowledge at my fingertips because I've I've read it and seen it and heard it enough that it's now in my memory bank. And I only do that with the very, very best stuff, but that also allows me on the fly in a meeting in front of a client when they ask me a tough question to be able to real recall important information off the top of my head, which it, it, again, it doesn't make me a genius, but it just makes me focused. Uh people look at you go how in the world did you know that how do you remember that spence i don't know how do you how can you quote these books off the top of your head it's not that i have a totally photographic memory i just see it six or seven times and then it's easier to remember yeah and it's a, actually it's a great recipe for how do you memorize a presentation or a speech or anything like that <laughs> is oh when i do a major major speech i did one last year to 19000 people I listened to my own speech on audio for a full month before I got there so that I could just walk on stage and be as comfortable and relaxed as possible. And I didn't nail 100% what was on the audio, but I got about 90%. And it I don't do that for every talk. Matter of fact, most talks I don't. But for that one in front of that many people, I had to nail it. And that's the way I did it was I listened to it over and over and over again until I could hear it play in my mind. Okay, excellent. So next, the second element of your knowledge account balance was, and this speaks to managers specifically, is hire top talent. So you write about hiring innovative and creative people, but it's really sort of people that don't necessarily fit a mold, right? No, no. And and by the way, for some people listening to that are solopreneurs, this is your network. This is your contacts. This is also the people that you read, study, listen to, who are part of your talent thing. Mm-hmm. But um. It's very, very simple. For most of us that run organizations, the success of your business is directly proportional to the quality of the people that you can get, keep, grow, and keep on your team. So the way you need to look at it is, is what is the unique knowledge, the skills, the abilities, the talent, and the values that I need for someone that will fit in the culture of my company, that will be fun to work with, that's in, you know, innovative, uh, creative, they're great at collaborating, and they've got a skill set that matches up nicely to mine. So they're really, really good at things that I'm not so good at, and I'm really, really good at things that will help them. But we've all heard this, and, 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 but it's true, is hire for attitude, aptitude, and I added a new one, integrity, train for skills. If I've got someone who's got a pretty good base – they're, they've got great aptitude to learn. They've got a positive attitude, and they're an honest, trustworthy, kind person. I want that person on my team. Uh, I just you. I know that all the people in the call have heard this. I just got a note from one of my clients said, I've got a salesperson who's really, really good, always hits his numbers, always exceeds his numbers, but he's rude, condescending, and aggressive with the rest of the staff. And I said, it's pretty simple. Great work with shitty attitude equals unemployment. 
Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Don't, hire, <laughs> don't hire that person. Yeah. So yeah, life's too short on that. So last element was have a large and vibrant network. Yeah. So, and it's, you know, there, there's so many books that are out there that talk about this, you know, the go giver and, you know, all the books about, you know, paying forward and, and the balance is more about giving than receiving. Oh, absolutely. Um, and Bob Berg is a friend that wrote go giver. It's a great book. Here's the way I look at it in, in a networking situation. It's 90% give 10% ask. You should be giving ideas, giving information, suggesting things, helping people, assisting people 90% of the time. Then every now and then, if you throw your hand up for help, people will run to assist you. Uh, I'll give you a quick example of this. I told you every morning I spend about 45 minutes or so going through Flipboard, Mm -hmm. reading the news. But I also read Inc. and Fortune and Forbes and Fast Company and Harvard Business Review. I scan all those. And when I find a really, really, really good article... I mean, a super one that makes me think, I immediately send it to myself. I go back, I type up a little intro to it, and then I've got about 700 senior executives at companies around the world that I've worked with in the last 20 years that are on my VIP list, and I shoot them that note and say, hey, just read this thing in strategy and business. It's on working with millennials or it's on changing business models or whatever it might be. I found it super interesting. I thought you might find it of value too. And I try to send an article out like that at least once a month, usually twice a month. And I've been doing that every month or every every month for 17 years. And I give, 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 give. And then every now and then if I say, wow, I need some help, I will get 200 emails back within an hour or two. Here's what I would do. Here's my suggestion. Here's somebody I can introduce you to. Oh, we've dealt with that in my company a hundred times. Here's exactly how to handle it. And here's the neat thing, Andy, is when you've got when you've got a big network like that, you're basically bulletproof and invisible. Um, I don't have all the answers, but I know that if I need something, I can find someone who has the answer. That out of my network, I'm probably only two degrees of separation away from pretty much anybody I need to get to on the face of the earth to ask for help. Which is just a perfect place to be because you said that. that <laughs> when you talk about bolstering your knowledge account balance, you don't need to have it yourself but you need to know where you can get it. And if you can get it and make it available to whoever you're helping prospect, customer, whatever your value goes up substantially. Oh, it exponentially. Yeah. One of the things I always tell my clients is if you need help with anything, anything, even if it's outside my expertise, you send me an email. And if I don't have the answer, I can find somebody who does. Exactly. And I've had them call me about things that are way out of my area of expertise. And by end of business, the same day I was able to put them in contact with one of the top people in the world that did it and solved their problem. It's it's really hard not to be seen as a trusted advisor, a partner and a peer if you can't if somebody can't pick up the phone. I mean if you can pick up the phone and do that and make that happen, that adds massive value to your clients. Exactly. Exactly. Well, perfect. Well, good. Well, we're going to move to the last the last segment of the show where I ask some uh, questions I ask standard questions I ask all my guests and the uh, first one's a hypothetical scenario where in this scenario, you've just been hired as a new sales leader at a company that sales have stalled out, desperately need to be turned around, senior management's anxious for it to happen. What two things would you do the first week on the job that could have the biggest impact? I would go to, I would identify who the top clients were for the company in the past, the ones that had the best, what we would call the ideal clients, and I would go interview all them. I, and I would ask them four questions. Why did you decide to do business with this company specifically? What are the three or four things that that they do is why you hired them? Number two, what are they doing now that frustrates you, make you angry, you wish they'd stop, start, change? Number three, what would it take to earn more of your business or earn your business back? And number four, what would we do that would cause you to terminate us? And I'd go to all the top clients and ask them that. Uh, The other thing I would do is I would probably do role plays with all the salespeople to see how they're selling. Are they coming in and pitching? Are they starting with their slide deck? If they ask questions, are they good questions? Are they open-ended, close-ended? Are they trying, do they have the courage to ask about budget, about decision-making process, things like that? Uh, I, or I do ride-alongs to find out that information. I'd shut my mouth and just listen and watch, but I'd want to see how are we selling now? And the key thing, and I, I think this is critical, is whoever owns the voice of the customer owns the marketplace. Most companies are not don't truly understand why their customers do business with them. Right. All right. Excellent answer. All right. We've got some rapid fire questions. Now you can give me one word answers or you can elaborate 
to your heart's content. So the first one is when you're selling, what's your most powerful sales asset? Asking great questions and listening. Name one tool you use for managing your own sales that you can't live without. Evernote. I love Evernote. Uh, who's your sales role model? Mahan Kahalsa and mm -hmm. uh, uh, what a minute. Is it Neil Rackham, Spin Selling? Yes. And Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play are my two favorite sales books I've ever read. Okay, excellent answer. So other than your own books, what's one book that every salesperson should read? Oh, wow. Now that's, um, I would see it, say it's Let's Get Real or Let's Not Play or Spin Selling. And I am not, I cannot believe, there's a ton of them out there. There's a ton of them out there. I would also read maybe uh, Cl Crossing the Chasm. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Moore. Okay. Yep. Yeah, which even though it's a marketing book, it's a great book for salespeople to understand the whole oh, yeah, chasm yeah. idea. Selling the Invisible is another great one. Oh, I love that book. I love that book. That was that's a very influential book with me. I read that, uh, gosh, when it first came out nearly 20 years ago. Um, all right, here's the toughest question of the day. What music's on your playlist? Oh, uh, Baroque music for concentration. Uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons. I know mm -hmm. it's crazy, but I, I listen to uh, classical music while I read because I don't start singing the words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I listen to instrumental as well. I've, I've got, as I've mentioned before, people are probably tired of hearing this, but when I write, I've got a Keith Jarrett piano concerto that goes on. And literally, it's like a Pavlovian response. Within the first two measures, I'm focused and I'm writing. I do that when I have to give big, big speeches. I've got some very specific Pachelbel and things like that, that as soon as I listen to them, I calm down and I'm, I can picture myself really doing a great job. And that's the stuff that gets me sort of in the right heartbeat to handle a, a crowd of 5,000, 10,000 people, which can be a bit overwhelming for some people. Yeah, I can imagine. So what's the first sales activity you do every day? Uh, I'm always trying to focus on what adds value to my clients. I'm reading, studying, learning every day to say, how can I help them? How can I think about their business? What's around the corner for them? What's going to impact them three to five years from now? So for me, it's studying their industries and knowing a lot about business so that I can figure out something that's going to happen to them a year before they figure it, figure it out. Okay, great answer. So last question. What's the one question you get asked most frequently by salespeople? How can I get in to see top level people? And your answer is? Be really, 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 really good at what you do. <laughs> I like that answer. That's it's hard to argue with that answer, right? Yeah, well, 88% of senior executives say I won't meet with salespeople because they waste my time. They have no value. You want to be the one, you want to be the one that they can't wait to see because they know you're going to come in with ideas, information, connections, uh, new creative things, solutions that they never would have thought of. You want to be the one that they, they beg you to go to lunch with them because they know how knowledgeable you are. Right. And how do you get that way? You read, 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 or listen, you know, read, listen, watch videos, spend that hour a day plus to make that happen. Couldn't agree more. All right. Well, John, I want to thank you for joining me. My guest, John Spence, please tell people how they can find out more about you. Oh, it's simple. Go to johnspence.com. And if you act, actually, if you click there, there's a resource page and I have the top 60 business books I've ever read listened, uh, listed there. And there's a bunch of great sales books. Uh, I also have a bunch of free videos and things like that. So there's a whole ton of free resources and book lists and things like that at johnspence.com. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And remember, friends, make it a part of your day every day to deliberately learn something new to help you accelerate your success. You can certainly subscribe to this podcast. That's an easy way to make sure that you don't miss any of my conversations with top business experts like my guest today, John Spence, who share their expertise about how to accelerate the growth of your business. So thanks for joining us. And until next time, this is Andy Paul. Good selling, everyone. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard and want to make sure you don't miss any upcoming episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes or Stitcher.com. For more information about today's guest, visit my website at andypaul.com.